Hello, Hi. everyone, uh, both Critical Role uh, stars and everyone watching at home. Wanted to thank you all for tuning in to SCAD TV Fest. Uh, for 10 years now, SCAD TV Fest has brought the best of television and the artists behind it audience of students, mm -hmm. fans, and aficionados. I'm Christian Hollow from EW, and today the festival welcomes the cast of The Legend of Vox Machina. Uh, I'm going to introduce everybody before we start talking. Uh, joining us today are Travis Willingham. Oh, hi. It's me. Laura Bailey. Ashley Johnson. Hello. <laughs> Marisha Ray. Hi. Liam O'Brien. Hey, hey, hey. And Sam Regal. It's me, Sam Regal. <laughs> <laughs> All right, awesome. So uh, without further ado, let's uh, get into our conversation. I wanted to start by asking you guys kind of a basic question, which is, um, you know, when you first came together, you first started playing the games that would become Critical Role that have now become the legend of Vox Machina. Um, what did you guys kind of all know about Dungeons and Dragons going in and related? Um, how much D&D &D knowledge would you say uh, is expected of viewers? Oh, boy, I'll <laughs> kick it off. Yeah, uh, you did. Birthday boy. I did. Yeah, I had played a bunch as a teenager, both as a player and a, as a young DM. And I read a lot of fantasy novels and played all kinds of uh, uh, tabletop games for like a three or four year period. But then I. I put it away in the closet for decades uh, and dusted it off uh, for that uh, fateful birthday. And uh, I think that uh, you don't need to know squat to enjoy our show. I mean, like, it's fun. It's great to know about all about the spells and the mechanics and stuff, but uh, it's just fun regardless. Totally agree, especially the animated series. You, you certainly don't need to know anything about uh, role-playing games in general. Um, you'll just see cool characters doing cool stuff and some of them cast spells and you don't know, need to know how any of that works. <laughs> it just works. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, well, I guess I wanted to, to add on to that. Um, mm -hmm. Since you guys saw in about uh, 2015, would you say that, uh, or how would you say that uh, as D&D &D feels like it's grown in, in cultural stature over those years? Like, is it easier to kind of explain the concept of a show based on D&D &D campaign to people now than when you started? I think just fantasy in general has, has grown, uh, especially since 2015. Yeah. I think people were also seeking that analog connection too. It was just perfect totally. time for people to sit together, play at a table, connect with their friends, make up stories. Um, and it just, it seemed like it experienced like an apex in entertainment as well. Game of Thrones was thriving, you know, Harry Potter did what it did. And we just continue to see it evolve and stories get bigger and wider. And, um, you know, it just seems like the collective imagination of players is primed for, for these types of, uh, types of stories. And, and so it was, uh, it was easy for us to jump in, like uh, myself and, and Laura, we, we hadn't played any, you know, RPGs before that, but we were big uh, RPG fans and just in terms of video games, Dragon Age, Mass well, Effect. you, you Dragon Age, yeah. Mass Effect. Skyrim, all of it. Who was you, who was, who were in love with in Dragon Age? Alistair. Alistair. I have a problem with Alistair, the character. I'm so a little jealous. Um, so when we jumped into that game, you know, we, we had that sort of experience. Uh, an expectation going into it, and it translates perfectly for me. <laughs> what? <Yeah. laughs> Just think about Alistair now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm just reliving all those moments. It <laughs> That's it. That's it. I remember that that time under that willow tree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, Travis, like you were saying, I think even before the uh, the pick D and D was kind of an interesting counterpoint to you know much of our lives take place on the internet now or, or on social media. Um, one of the great things about Critical Role is you guys kind of found a way to combine those things. Um, and certainly during the pandemic, like Zooming with my D&D &D group was uh, one of my favorite sources of social interaction uh, in 2020. Um, and I guess from there, I, I, you know, when it comes to, um, I'm interested in that, in the thing that makes D&D &D unique, kind of the group collaboration. Um, what would you guys say that, you know, working on this over the years together um, has taught you kind of about collaboration and about storytelling. Oh boy. 
Well, pretty much the loudest voice wins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Talk over each Talk other. Talk over each other. All the time. Yeah. yeah. Get that spotlight. Uh huh. <laughs> it is your own. story. You're the hero of your narrative. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone else is just set pieces. No, the great thing about uh, he who shall not be named, Matt Mercer, who's not here with us today. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, it's like, wait, who? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, Matt, our amazing GM who, who runs uh, the live shows um, and, and is our story master uh he's so great at, at setting up um awesome uh, uh awesome things for us as players to uh investigate and explore and gives us the leeway to explore our characters and our relationships but um but over the years yeah like like learning how to tell this story together has been just a wild experience to see like you know uh, none, none none of the story went as anyone planned yeah. but it all it went all as went. we all planned right like yeah. so i'm sure matt does mm -hmm. uh where we end up in the campaigns isn't where he thought we would and it's not where we thought we would either but it's somewhere cooler that is it's a mind meld and it tells such a unique interesting story and we get to look back on it together and be like hey we all did that together mm -hmm. it's, it's really wonderful and it's it's bonded us forever there are you know at least four of these five people I would be friends with forever. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I do think it is translated on a meta level as well. Wow. You know, we've branched off and decided to start our own company and we've all kind of found our own tent poles within this collaboration that is Critical Role itself. So I really do think all of the years and hours and hours of collaborative storytelling role playing has also really primed us to be great teammates as well. Yeah. For sure. It's been a there's always so much joy out of seeing each other around the table and then now as we do everything we're doing just sort of succeed and and do amazing things and be creative and you, know, you start out as a, just as an actor if you look at it from that angle you're like how can I how can I make it in this business but that's not what we do here we sort of like celebrate everyone we see around the table with us and now everyone in the company with us. Yeah, it's funny when we were, you know, before we ever started streaming, when we were at home playing, like the the amount we've evolved as as players together over time, because there would be a lot of over talking at home and stuff, you know, we would just have a group discussion going at all times. And now eating like, yeah, eating so much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> over all the years, we've kind of grown to recognize when a player is even about to have a moment we can see like a shift i can see marisha shift in her seat and know she's going to step up in this moment and like you give her the spotlight and it's funny how we all have that intuition with each other now i did make a little fart noise there and i'm so proud of myself oh. <laughs> the I was, right as i was moving so I it was like it's coming from me yeah. that's great <laughs> collaboration it's come along <laughs> <laughs> and trust <laughs> Um, awesome. I wanted to something you said, Sam, about kind of looking back at, at where the campaigns end up and uh, maybe not where anybody expected. Um, I believe you guys have done two campaigns now and the show is based on the first one. Um, what's kind of been fun about about revisiting that earlier campaign and kind of your earlier adventures uh, in this new format? Oh, uh, it's been amazing to kind of look back and see the story that we told, um, uh, we, you know, it's been years since we've done it. Uh, and to go back and listen to it, what's going on? Right there? No, they're, they're just you're, comparing saying, fashion. you're saying really important we're, things. We're, oh, we're, we're just talking about bracelets. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this is typical for us. Um, going back and, and rewatch, we all had to sort of like rewatch or re-listen to the original campaign to remember what happened because it's hundreds and hundreds of hours of content that we made together. And so getting ready for the animated series, we knew that we needed to boil that way, way, way down. And so all of us uh, went and sort of kind of did like a, the greatest hits. Like we all picked a few moments from the campaign that we were like, this has to be in there. Um, this was one of my favorite moments. Uh, and we, we just wrote down a list um, and had to, <laughs> that was, that list was sort of the starting point outline for, for what the show was going to be like these, this list of epic moments or, or memorable moments uh, that we had shared together that we wanted to sort of re-explore or revisit in some way. Obviously a lot of stuff didn't make it onto the show, um, but we, we tried to preserve at least a, a piece of the magic that uh, got us there in the first place. And one of the things I think that was made, made better uh, now that at the time of this interview, 
episodes one through six are out uh, is that our good friend Ashley Johnson, Ashley <laughs> Jenkins, she hey! she was gone for a lot of the That's first campaign awesome. because she was shooting a Blind Spot in New York, and we've been able to figure a storyline for Pike Trickfoot that still uh, represents that time away, but also tells a, a divided storyline so that you know there are multiple things happening at the same time. So we took it as an opportunity to improve the story and to build it out more and and to really flesh it out and give her some stuff to to work with. And it's while um, Pike was away. Yeah. Away. <laughs> yeah, away, away. She was doing a lot, and we stuff. get to see it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, it also creates like a when uh, when Pike kind of goes off her own. That's kind of a fun surprise for anybody going into the show expecting like you know a D and D campaign, a, a cohesive thing, and like oh what they're breaking off, they're splitting up. Like what's going splitting on now? The party, Cardinal yeah. party, yeah, yeah. yeah we- it's, it's a little extra that we get to add to the story that. Um, you know, it was something that we all kind of talked about. It's just like a little supplemental um, side quest that got to happen. Yeah. And, you know, it's added, added, <laughs> added canon. <laughs> but as Sam mentioned, like, you know, the show is made for people that have no idea or have any experience with, you know, tabletop RPGs in any way. But we also want to keep our current fans, like, we want to keep them on their toes. We want to mix mm-hmm. it up, change it up, present new things, make them go like, wait a minute, this is different. And unsettle them just a little bit so that uh, so they don't know everything going into the show. Yeah, yeah. who sure. knows? You don't know what's going to happen. Maybe Vex is the big bad guy after all. Maybe. <laughs> That's probably. Big bad. Probably what it is. Yeah. It sounds you bad. just gave it away, Sam. I uh, <laughs> said maybe. Now we That's have to change. the campaign <laughs> as I remember. <laughs> Um, awesome. That mention of of highlights, you guys kind of going through and, and each picking uh, some highlights from the campaign to focus on. Um, that that's similar to, to something I wanted to ask, which is just, um, you know, what are some personal favorite things um, from each of your characters that that are fun kind of seeing on screen and see make it into the TV show? I know playing D&D, sometimes you do stuff just to make yourself laugh or, or just to make your friends laugh. Uh, what's particularly fun to see, uh, you know, on screen? <laughs> I mean, the magic. Yeah. Magic's pretty great. Magic's great. <clears throat> yeah. Seeing all of that realized and kind of how you had it in your head. And now it's, mm. you're like, yeah, that's, that's kind of cooler than what I actually had. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> I love seeing like the epic wins, but also the epic failures. <laughs> yeah. It's just like the whole door sequence. Yeah. I was so happy that that made it into the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. how yeah. a natural one yeah, would actually out. play out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's pretty mm-hmm. great. I also love that we've we've kept all the little sort of uh, nicknames and just unique every every pairing. Whenever you send two people off into a corner to have a conversation, those people talk only one specific way. It's different. You know, it's not you, you, the way that Scanlan and Vax talk is different than the way that Scanlan and Grog talk. And we've just kept all those little idiosyncrasies, and it just it just makes it better. Yeah, nicknames, mm-hmm. all the good stuff. Uh, totally. And something I'm definitely curious about, maybe you guys have talked about, uh, before, which is just, um, you know, how would you say that you each, uh, compare to your characters? Um, I mean, I know from talking to you, I can kind of see, you know, you see who does, who's doing accents and and who isn't. Um, and I know in, (laughs) in RPGs sometimes it's fun to maybe it's fun to play a character who has some of your personality in it. And it's also fun to play someone who's, you know, someone who's uh, very different from you. Uh, um, so he's interested in kind of hearing and contrast. Pseudo accents, right? For some of us, <laughs> I, pseudo I, accents that are not I mean, like, specific to I, Sam Regal, I'm from Washington, DC, but Scanlon's accent is actually from Northern Virginia. It's <laughs> 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 a very subtle difference that not many will pick up on. <laughs> I feel like with Pike, sometimes she sounds younger than me and sometimes kind of my voice, maybe sometimes older. It changes a lot. <laughs> on the day very very nuanced nobody yeah. talks in one pitch all the time no. so i think showing that range showing I mean, the range. that's a three-dimensional yes yeah. my my range is is you know low pike or high pike or you know <laughs> wow, pretty impressive stunning. i know i mean <laughs> accents aside those characters yeah. were our fir- for many of us our first you know mm-hmm. characters that we ever yep. uh uh, created or at least the first ones that we we kept playing for for 350 hours 
Um, and so there is a lot of our personalities in them. Obviously, Travis isn't a dummy, but but he's got you know there's parts of you deep down inside oh, yeah. that are that are ragey or that are <laughs> that are a little obsessed with shiny things or, or small things like, <laughs> like little cute yep. things. Oh, sure. big time! Yeah, I mean, just taking the filter from brain to mouth out and letting that. I mean, that's who Grog was. So even though we had a, a you know a scripted uh, episode, we still were able to improvise while we were recording, and there was a lot of dialogue that just in the moment or off of the way that somebody delivered something, we would just blah, 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 just fall back out. And <laughs> yeah. There was Grog being a doomie. <laughs> Not a dummy. A a dummy. <laughs> uh, yeah, but to what Sam said, I feel like there's a little bit of, I, I feel like it would be really hard to sit at a table to play any RPG and not have a little bit of yourself in the character. Um, so I think there's, there's, there's a little bit of, I think all the characters that we've gotten to play at the table, there's there's definitely yeah. elements of of us that are in there. Yeah, it's kind of like each character shines a light on a different aspect of ourselves. Yeah, right? That's what it is. yeah. You're it's playing like, with one room in the house. Yeah. yeah. What do you want to lean into, and then what do you want to explore? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Sure. It's kind of yeah. like two polar opposites. With Vax, he's obviously way cooler than I am, and definitely more agile. But certainly, as the years went on, like the thing that we share the most is he like adores the people around him. Mm-hmm. And is like stupidly loyal. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's good with knives. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Just like you. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's awesome. I wanted to uh, share a couple questions that were submitted by uh, some of the SCAD students aspiring to be part of this business. I think the, the questions they submitted um, are things we haven't quite covered yet. So I wanted to get that into the discussion. Uh, They come from a cross-section of performing arts, film and television, animation students studying here at SCAD, and they're also big fans of the show. Um, So I wanted to start with uh, a question from Jack Baldwin, a junior film and television major. Uh, His question is, he wanted to know kind of about the differences in format going from a web series to an animated series. Uh, what were some of the challenges there and was it more or less challenging uh, than you expected going in? Oh boy. Shout out Jack Baldwin. Great questions. Yeah. (laughs) Definitely more challenging. I would say, I think we had an idea of what we expected in terms of production, whether it was pre-production design, writing the scripts, executing the recording sessions. uh, And once we got into it, it was more than we could have ever anticipated, which is how it should be. It was a a massive learning process from from start to finish. Um, But I think, as Sam Sam touched on, it was just, you know, how are we going to represent these these stories and characters as as best we can in the little bitty time that we have in this 22-minute episodic format? It's not 44 minutes, it's not an hour. Um, and as much as we want to jump out of the gate and go, these characters are well-rounded, they've got all these facets and, and idiosyncrasies, you got to build an arc that can slowly reveal itself with time uh, and allow new people coming to the show a chance to, to see them as well. But what, what, what about you guys? What, what was surprising about jumping into animation production? Oh, God. I feel like, I feel it's, like- a, it's, it, it's interesting going from something that we have over how many hours? I guess over, it was like I over 400 at the first oh, yeah. camp. Yeah. yeah, to sort of take all of that and turn it into, you know, under a 30 minute episode, yeah, 22, 22. 22 minute episodes, you know, so it's almost like a blessing and a curse to have all of that content. We have a lot to choose from, but at the same time, it's finding those little special moments. But I feel like it was kind of a natural progression in a way, mm-hmm. you know, because it's, it's, like Marisha said, you can show, you can show the magic um, that we're doing and the spells, and you can just visually see it better. Yeah. I feel like it's a, it was a, a good next step. Yeah, it was interesting to me the things that we had to, kind of rearrange story wise um, to make it make sense, you know, because a lot of things have to play out in different orders, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that was an interesting part of adapting working scripts. Working and reworking and yeah. reworking and a new idea and rework. Focusing it. Yeah, yeah. and also because when you're play, playing a game uh, or a campaign like we were, the characters don't really, they wander a bit, right? They, yeah, they, they mean, go searching and they find a dead end and go back. And in, in when you only have 12 episodes in a season, 
you can't really just meander. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got to just I keep mean, keep moving. So. Even late game keyless, we could teleport anywhere mm -hmm. at any time. Right. So many times a day. Yeah. So it wouldn't be uncommon for us to be like five minutes in a month. Then we're gonna bamf over here back to Marquette, <laughs> yeah. and then we're gonna we can be back in Whitestone for dinner. Yeah. And then, uh, but in an animated series, you're like. How, what? Too much. Too much. Can't animate that. I've also, likened, very expensive. Yeah. <laughs> I've always likened what we do together around the table to like you, you get the best of what you get from rehearsal, which is mm. it's an exploration. It was four to five hundred hours of exploration, and you know errors and flops and uh, were made along the way. But because it was we were making it up as we went along, you felt a real freedom to try anything, to do anything, which made amazing gems happen uh, amongst us and in the story. It also made like really weird things happen, <laughs> nonsensical <laughs> things happen. So moving from, from what we did uh, here and, and bringing it over to the Legend of Vox Machina, just it was distilling all those hundreds of hours of what feel like the, you know, like a, a science experiment, except that it was Done with magic. So I guess what is that? <laughs> sure. Done. Yeah. Yeah. Like our our highlight reels, basically that we all you know submitted of our favorite moments. Like some of those favorite moments were a a fifteen minute long conversation in the game, right? Mm. That in the episode we still want to honor that, but it has to be kind of yeah. six lines. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> like how do you condense it, but also get the same emotion mm -hmm. with those much smaller moments that we we can afford. Awesome. Um, well, we've got another question here from Regina Vera, who's studying animation here at SCAT. And I think you can probably uh, see that in her question, which is Vox Machina has spanned many years and had plenty of official art as well as lots of fan art pieces over the years. Um, did all that make it uh, more complex to establish the look and feel that you had to develop for the animated series? Or did you come into it kind of with a clear vision of what you wanted it to look like from the start? What about you, our dad? You want to take question. that? Oh boy, I don't know how to answer it. It's that's such a complex question. It's a great question. It's both. Yeah. Mm. Um, I don't know. I mean, like, there's never been anything quite like our show ever, where where mm -hmm. a, like a live, improvised fantasy story was being created and watched and reacted to almost like real time and people would create uh mind-blowing art or really like quick simple but hilarious art or anything you can think of in in hours sometimes minutes sometimes or days um so it was really cool along the way to see people's imagined idea of those things reflected back at us um and and nobody's imagination of our story is definitive neither is it wrong like and that's true for all of us at the table as well we all have our version in our mind of what happened in that moment um but i think by the end of it we lived in the skins of these characters for so long that we all we all knew individually who they were to us each so once we got into the room with phil Yes. It was just about talking about just like the moments in the, in the story. It was like, what's the most important to us? Mm -hmm. Yeah, on the production side, it was interesting because we, you know, when you see it, like, you know, mm -hmm. it when art speaks to you, right, as creators. And so we, we, we took a look at a few different designs and a few different takes at the characters to really try and push outside the boundary, like crazy, crazy stuff, right? And, um, you look at it and you see it and you're like, ah, I don't know. I just don't know if that's going to tell the sort of stories that we want, or I don't know if that's going to translate to action sequences in the way that we want. There was definitely a vibe that we were trying to hit. And until we saw it, we, we, we just weren't happy. And again, it was this fateful flight to New York Comic Con where Phil Barassa ended up sitting across the aisle from us. And I saw him and I was like, hey, man, it's good to see you. Wait, Wait a, minute. a second. I remember like you were like saying hi to him and then you looked over at me and you were like, Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Just like that. I mean, his style was almost exactly what I had been picturing in, in my head and trying to communicate. And 
I said, hey, man, give us a shot at these characters, if you, if you would. He said, yes, we saw it. We you know, sent it to the rest of the cast. And uh, first, Sam and I saw it, and we were doing little happy dances in a room. And then we brought it over to the lobby in the studio <laughs> over here. And we were standing in front of the fridge showing Matt and Talison and everybody else. And we were like, yeah, yes, yes, <laughs> this is it. Let's tweak this. This is it. Yeah. You know, and so it was just one of those things where, you know, like a, like a casting process almost. Mm -hmm. You're you're just excited to find it and you know it when you when you see it. And uh, so we were we were overjoyed to yeah. find it. And it's funny because we'd been such fans of Phil's for such a long time, but like never thought there was any way that we'd be able to have him working on this project mm -hmm. and it was just you're like i'm just gonna ask him i'm just gonna ask him i know it's not gonna work out but i have to bring it up yeah yeah it's true like awesome. still fangirling about it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> phil <laughs> you <laughs> you're so you cool <laughs> you never know what's gonna talk to you either like that's why we we had that big search too because you know we want to explore different takes and we we want to see what uh what hits and what and what doesn't yeah Awesome. Well, uh, last question from uh, from our SCAD students here, um, SCAD animation student James Johnson, um, wanted to ask about incorporating 3D into the series and, and mm -hmm. how 3D animation um, was used in the show. Yeah, uh, we when we set out to make the show, we didn't have any plans to use uh, 3D animation or computer uh, computer animation at all. Um, and, uh, the studio that we, uh, that we use Titmouse, um, they're amazing. And, uh, all of our early talks were just 2d, 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 but when we got into the actual production of it in the pipeline, uh, we realized that some of the larger creatures, um, which I guess some episodes are out already. So there, there are dragons in the show. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, those are just kind of impossible to draw, uh, mm -hmm. by hand, uh, consist consistently, um, because it's just a lot, it's a lot of lines and it's a lot of, it's, it's a lot of detail. Mm -hmm. And we realized we need to, we needed to supplement, um, the 2d designs with some 3d stuff. And luckily Titmouse uh, can do it all. And working with our overseas studio production rev, um, they figured out a pipeline to, to integrate some 2d with, uh, some 3d, uh, uh, creatures into our 2d world and shade them and uh, line them in a way that it doesn't stand out um, in any way. And it's been great. Uh, it's really expanded our, our options in terms of creatures and monsters out there. Um, it, would, it would stink if we could only uh, encounter human, humanoid type <laughs> creatures in our world, because uh, you know Matt's world of Exandria is expansive right. and has so many different kinds of uh, characters. And now we can we can do it. It takes a little longer and it's, it's, it's tricky, <laughs> but, um, but once it hits, it, it's, it's really well integrated. Yeah. That learning process, right. It was 100% that it was a CG model and then building a better CG model and figuring out a frame rate that would match with the 2d animation so that it wasn't yeah. as jarring to the eye. And these were all things that we just learned week after week after week. And, you know, it gets better throughout the the season and into season two, which I won't say anything about. But you know, it was uh, it was amazing just to see the skilled minds over at Titmouse problem solve these things in real time as well, because they approach it from a a certain angle, and then they are, as we were, figuring it out on the fly. And that's really the best part about the artistic and collaborative process is everybody's bringing their A game each and every day, and even if you come up against an issue and you're like, "How are we going to do this?" It's in the script. We're going to do it. And then it's just a, a matter of, you know, working the problem until you find the solve. And it's, it's so, so important to have a, a, a team around you that's able to, to do that and be flexible and listen um, in order to be able to, to arrive at that solve. Yeah. Like, I mean, just to uh, point out one thing that Travis was talking about, like just the, the frame rate thing is, is wild to me. Like animation is 12 frames a second. Um, but all, when we initially got the dragon, uh, it was 24 frames a second. And so it just, uh, it just moved differently from the other characters yeah. and it stood out. And so, uh, they figured out a way to, you know, stagger it, um, stutter it, uh, so that it moves at the same frame rate as the other characters. And it, it doesn't stand out anymore. Magic movie magic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Uh, before we go, I kind of just wanted to, to ask one more thing. Um, it's something that's come up, I think, a couple times in the discussion 
um, mentioning fan art and kind of that real time interaction with fans and that the, the show is meant to be watched, uh, you know, both by first time viewers and, and also longtime fans. Uh, I'm wondering if you guys could just uh, speak a little to the role of of your fans and listeners and kind of getting the show uh, to this point, whether it's supporting in Kickstarter campaigns or, or doing fan art or just kind of loving the show. Um, what has their role been in kind of uh, creating the legend of Vox Machina? Oh, my gosh. We wouldn't be here without them. Yeah. 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 hundred percent. First and foremost. Yeah. If the fans hadn't turned up the way they did from the get-go, I mean, mm -hmm. we wouldn't be sitting here right now. I mean, even although you mentioned the fan arts and seeing the fan animatics that they still create all the time, and the more that we started, you know, started seeing all of these animated versions of our character way back in 2015, 2016, and it was like, oh, yeah, this could this could be something. And then of course, you know, the Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's an amazing feedback loop that happens in the, in the community, in the critter community, you see art and it sparks other artists and we see it and we see the, the animatics and that sparks ideas. And then we reach out to them to work on, on different projects. And it's just this constantly evolving like ecosystem of, of creativity, which is just so, so cool. It's mm -hmm. a, it's a blessing. Uh, for for all the years we've been doing this now to work with so many talented people and uh some of them are artists who have been there with us from the beginning and now as we've made the legend of vox machina we have all these talented people around us and it's just you know i can't imagine anything better than that sound oh, what's happening? i'm sorry, <laughs> sorry ashley's got to go up to starfleet <laughs> <laughs> I wish. I know. <laughs> Some of our fan artists have ended up uh, uh, working on the show. Like, yep. yeah, 100%. Yeah. The Legend of Vox yeah. Machina em employs several people who used to just be viewers. Yeah. yeah. Um, yep. And we're so happy to have them and, and uh, spread the love, but also like they're super talented. I mean, there's you, you, you've seen the art. It's real. It's yeah. real good. It's the coolest <laughs> shorthand because they know the show. They bring it in their storyboard mm -hmm. artists, their revisionists. They bring their own influence into it. I mean, it's not like we're over here, you know, directing every single frame of animation. There's a lot of, um, you know, artistic leeway, a lot of agency that's given to these artists, and they just come in and rock it. And when they know the show, it's just that much. It's just that much better. And even now, the critters like showing up to watch the show and mm -hmm. getting, you know, as Liam was talking about that, like as an artist, you crave that feedback from the audience. And yeah, it's, it feels good. Yeah. It has been it a lot good. of fun to see the fan art reemerge for Vox Machina. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah, it's just. Like, oh, there thing. they are. Yeah, it's so nice <laughs> to see. Yeah. Right? Yeah. All the yeah. dragon person. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, that uh, that feels like a, a perfect circle kind of way to end this conversation. Um, everybody watching, uh, please give a big virtual round of applause for our panelists. Uh, critical Role, thank you for <laughs> should we give, should we give that. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you all at home for your participation today and please enjoy the rest of SCAD TV Fest. Amazing. Thank you. Yay. All right. Bye.